Uh, uh, let's get my slides. What the heck? Hold on. All right. Uh, do you see it? Not yet. Hold on. You got it now? Yeah, you're just on your last slide though, so. I don't know how that happened, but okay. You have to see the whole lecture in reverse. <laughs> in, in backwards, in reverse. <laughs> yeah, the pro one of the problems though, it's not a big problem, but there are a couple of videos that won't play. Okay, no problem. Just because I'm on a Mac and I had, you know, I was going to present this from my office, so. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, let me just, probably an easier way to do this, but I'd rather, now that I have it up on the screen, I don't want to mess it up. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, so just take a minute, you know, I mean, I could go to the, you know, we'll get there fast enough here. <laughs> Almost there. And, and there we are. Good. Okay, great. Uh -huh. Let's start. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our CAT conference, the first of 2021. Uh, we wish you all a happy new year. And we thought it would be appropriate to start with uh, really one of my favorite speakers to listen to and learn from, and a great friend and mentor, Jeff Moses. Um, we also have a great panel today with uh, Dimitrios Biagos from White Plains Hospital and Antonio Colombo and, and Patricia Presbitero from Milano. Um, and we'll try and make this as lively as possible. Please send your questions by chat as usual. And we'll try to address them uh, at the end. Uh, Jeff, it's all, thank you for taking the time. I mean, lesion preparation atherectomy is something that you know, in our practice here in New York and certainly mine here in the Bronx has become so important. We see so many calcified lesions. Yeah. And it seems like I'm doing atherectomy more and more. But it would be great to get this overview from you on, you know, on really how to use it, who to use it on, and how it actually works. Yeah. yeah and I, I, you know, I'm going to focus here on certain principles. And this is sort of my own take and interpretation of the data. Um, a lot of this work I'll give credit to has been with uh, Kiko and Gary Mintz and all their fellows. They've done a, you know, an enormously great job and leveraging a lot of data also from St. Francis. So um, I don't have any conflicts here. Uh, why do we prep in calcium? I mean, first of all, it makes the procedure easier. I mean, you can get lesion access for balloons and stents. But also, uh, the whole goal here, and this is what I want to sort of emphasize, is it's about changing lesion compliance. This is to minimize vessel trauma and avoid dissections, which just bullying through with balloons uh, can create, especially the worst nightmare is, of course, a dissection without actually the lesion yielding. And also, obviously, to ultimately to maximize stent expansion and to uh, you know, avoid polymer trauma and the like. This is what we're talking about. I mean, this sometimes is a little calcium overkill. I find in you know live cases that people are calling calcium when I frankly don't see it. But this is the deal. It's really this is the ne the, the nemesis. Uh, it's usually a still frame and both sides of the vessel, and uh, you know, and, and there it is. It's what we call railroad tracking. Usually, it's 15 millimeters in the lesion. Now we've recognized this as a problem literally from the earliest days of intracoronary imaging. And I think I'm gonna emphasize that a lot. We've learned a lot about this. I think, you know, Antonio certainly gives a, gets a lot of credit for a lot of pioneering work on this uh, back in the earliest days of stenting. Um, but as you can see here, the key here is that when you looked at um, stent expansion, we found early on and you looked at the uh, calcium arc as you can see, stent expansion became minimized. And this is some early observations, which you're gonna see reinforce this, I think a little more, some more sophisticated analysis, but stent expansion dropped. But with atherectomy, as you can see, it compensated for it very early on and you maintain stent expansion in those same lesions with a larger arc of calcium uh, that um, allowed you to actually optimize your stent expansion. Uh, this slide I like showing because it, you know, it's, and I think Antonio will appreciate this because when we looked at our 
this is a retrospective of, a, of, of uh, almost 300 ISR lesions at, at, at Columbia. And if you look here, this is still the, the DES era, but we were still seeing BEMS. But the key here is when you looked at restenosis, the, the frequency of uh, under expansion in the bare metal era was really under 30%. As the generations progressed and stents got better, I mean, obviously neointimal hyperplasia went, uh, became less, but the, the cause under expansion became a more predominant cause. In other words, we were getting lazier also in terms of our stent expansion, because look at the percentage with MSAs less than five. I mean, so, you know, the stents got so good that people got a little casual and we weren't fighting for, you know, for real estate, which is all we had in the bare metal era. And they, people thought the biology would take care of it. And a lot of this stent expansion, of course, is due to uh, calcification. Now, I think a big advance in this recent years, I mean, this is, this is what we're talking about in assessment from that previous slide with circumferential calcium. Um, and here's, you know, here's a calcific arc of about 180. But when you put in OCT, this opened, I think, gave us a whole new dimension of uh, understanding of uh, the behavior of calcium and its interaction with our outcomes. I mean, here's this circumferential one, which you would think was worse than the thing on the right in some, in some sense. But as you can see here, it's really a thin layer of calcium. Um, but here, as you can see on this one, which is only 180, this is a very thick calcific uh, plaque. And I think the idea and the ability to actually measure uh, cal calcium volume, uh, not just arcs of calcium, gave us tremendous insights. And it got to the point, and sort of this is a derivation with a lot of work uh, by uh, uh, Ziad Ali and Makiko and uh, the Schla Evan and Schlafmitz and Richard Schlafmitz. They actually got together and put together a scoring system. And as you can see here, when you looked at um, the, you know, sort of the rule of fives, an angle of greater than uh, 180, when you looked at a uh, half a centimeter, half a centimeter thickness of calcium, and when you looked at five millimeters of length, that's where you started seeing a true decrement in terms of uh, stent expansion if you just uh, used a, a balloon uh, angioplasty. And I think this is very important because I find, frankly, in, in, in when I see uh, cases being performed live, people just say, okay, we have a, you know, 270 of calcium, we can use atherectomy. You really have to integrate, you know, all these factors to maximize the uh, utility of the, uh, of the um, of atherectomy. We've, this has been recently extended by the same group with to uh, a scoring system with, um, with IVIS. And if you start with a, at least 270 or above, it, you can put a score together. If it's 270 and it's five millimeters, that gives you a point. If you have 360, if you see a nodule, or if you have a, a smaller vessel, uh, then you start, uh, can put together a scoring system. And as you can see here in the validation cohort, again, when you have three points or more, similar to what we saw in the OCT score, you see it. Uh, you see it dropping off in terms of stent expansion. This is attenuated in the atherectomy cohort, so it more mimics the, you know, the, the cohort without angiograph for calcium, which of course there is some calcium, as we know, if you don't see it on angiography, there are no fours here because you, you really don't see that four score in a, uh, a group without, you know, without um, calcification. And if you really think of it conceptually, the atherectomy really attenuates uh, the, the decrement and stent expansion that you would see with balloon angioplasty and, and optimize it. And you see, this is pretty consistent whether you use I, the IVA scoring system or the, uh, uh, or the OCT based system. And this is just an example of a calcium score of two treated with road ablation and you get, you know, circumferential calcium. And here's the, ro here's the after rotational atherectomy and then you get excellent uh, stent uh, stent expansion. So I think, you know, using, using imaging now, I think we could really optimize our utility of, of these devices. And when you, you know, because it's not infrequent, we see these 
calcified vessels. I know I had one just uh, yesterday, which I was sure I'd have to do a thorectomy, an intravascular imaging. It was just deep calcium. And there you can use NCs or scoring balloons or specialty balloons, which I'm not going to discuss. But when you see nodular calcium or extensive superficial calcium, that's where you really maximize the utility of these atheroablative techniques and why they should be employed selectively in the sense that just the angiogram per se shouldn't drive it. Uh, it, you, you sometimes discover uh, worse uh, calcification you anticipate with intravascular imaging as well. Now, the, uh, I'm not going to belabor this, but this is sort of one set, data set indicating the outcomes with calcium and the treatment out. This was ADAPT, DV, uh, DES was an all comers uh, trial with 8,000 patients. Its focus was on um, antiplatelet therapy, but the point is this was all comers. So, unlike the DES trials, uh, we had heavy calcification in. in in a larger group because extensive calcification is generally an exclusion for these DES trials. And what we saw here, interestingly, when you had, when you had uh, extensive calcification, you know, again, similar to uh, what we see in, you know, in, in national surveys, the use of atherectomy actually was only about 6% and some cutting and scoring balloons are only 2%. So they're still predominantly treated with uh, balloon uh, angioplasty. Um, importantly, uh, what you see is when you have coronary calcification, target vessel failure goes up early and a spreading curve over the course of a 24 months. And this is emulated by numerous surveys. And the point is, as Azim was uh, intimating before in his practice and all of ours, with advancing age, more kidney disease, prior cabbage, all the diabetics, we are seeing just more and more calcification. It's a growing problem. We really need to understand it. This is general one survey actually looking at the frequency of calcification just over the course of, of a decade in the aughts into one. And as you can see, it's gone up to a third of, uh, a third of, uh, of uh, patients. Now there are numerous um, treatments for this. I'm not gonna talk about cutting balloons or laser. We're gonna focus on atherectomy. And I'm not going to really talk about lithoplasty, which I think between Azim and Antonio, you can get much more expert experience on than uh, my limited experience, even though I think this is a very promising technique. <clears throat> the guidelines aren't particularly helpful. There's no class, key is there's no class 1A for uh, atherectomy. It's all, you know, uh, maybe 2C with heavily calcified lesions for atherectomy. And the initial, obviously, entry into this, which is now decades old, is the rotoblader, which has really stood up pretty well. Uh, and this is a, a forward cutting device with a diamond coated burr that ranges from one and a quarter to uh, two and a half. It still has this uh, uh, dedicated guide wire, um, though I think in the future, I think this should be you know, modified since we don't have to fight for uh, you know, guide, you know, guide lumens anymore with this since we use limited burrs. Um, and the key is you use this with continuous movement to keep it from really overheating and also not getting entrapped. This is the, the latest iteration. They're retiring the old, uh, old rotor links. And the key here is there were, uh, ch the big change is eliminating the foot pedal and you have all the controls on the, um, on the handle including the activation knob. This first iteration, frankly, some of us found a little annoying in terms of the fact that to use Dynaglide, you had to have two fingers on there for release. Uh, uh, if you can do single operator techniques um, and, uh, and also it's just responsiveness and the like was not uh, optimal. We'll get to that in a minute. And of course they put this into this now little cart with a much more advanced uh, algorithmic, um, uh, uh, you know, algorithmic um, uh, console now, which really sets it at a certain level for you as well. Now, recently they've modified this with a hands-free Dynaglide, which I think is much better. And plus it did make it more responsive with a quicker uh, response in this. So it feels more like the old rotor blader and I think this is actually an improvement over the, uh, the, the classic. And again, with this new console, it also gives you um, more warnings if you drop down below 5,000 and whether you're putting on too much pressure, 
to see de decrements or even a, a stall. And I think the idea is never to get to the red, but uh, keep yourself, when you see the yellow, start backing off. Uh, if you're digging in and putting too much pressure, which can lead to uh, multiple problems, not just closure, but also stuck uh, burrs. Now, this device, as do both atherectomy devices in common practice now, use you know, what's called differential cutting. And the idea is the same way you, you, know, you shave, is the idea elastic tissue moves away and then inelastic tissue actually gets, um, uh, gets uh, sh shaved or, or burred or, or sanded. But, it, but keep in mind, you can turn elastic tissue into inelastic if there's a, enough guide wire bias, right? That will stretch this, I call it like a drum head, and then it can transfer into this. And we'll talk about that, but that's where you can get into trouble in, uh, you know, with potential uh, perforations and angulated lesions. Another aspect that's important is of course, the orthogonal displacement of friction. So when you're moving longitudinally, the, uh, the spinning of it allows it to negotiate uh, uh, tortuous segments and get you distally uh, uh, with, you know, with, with much more facility than if you just try to push the device down. And that's one of the uh, advantages, of course, of the Dynaglide function as well. Now, the point here, I certainly like to hear, you know, other comments from our other uh, operators, but you know, the idea of debulking and talking about it really in contemporary practice drives me crazy. We did used to debulk. Actually, it was called directional atherectomy, where we could have manifest de decrements in the plaque burden after atherectomy. Uh, that device is abandoned. And frankly, what we found in trying to uh, apply that systematically is we really, most people weren't very good at that either. So the point here, it's, it's lesion modification. And we'll be emphasizing this over and over again. The point here is here's your plaque. Let's say this is your calcification. You know, with your wire bias, the, you, what you do is you, you're not debulking. If you did the volumetric analysis of say this lesion, it would be minimally changed. But as you can see here, I like this is what I call the snowman. You, you, you're, you're cutting into the calcium at a specific spot. And what that does it, is it thins out the calcium and we've quantified that. That's where that half, you know, uh, half centimeter uh, OCT insight is given us. And when you get it below that level, you have an ability to actually leverage this and create a dissection and mobilize all the plaque in the vessel to facilitate balloon and ultimately stent expansion. So, you know, so this idea of sizing up to debulk as opposed to maybe, you know, thin out the uh, plaque more uh, needs to be uh, revised. I just don't like that uh, conversation. This is sort of an illustration of it. If you look at, if you look at the middle uh, aspects of this, as you can see, this is where the IVIS is where the roto wire was. And as you can see, this is where you see it uh, polishing these reverberations or polishing. So you're, you know, so you're really working into the calcium where the wire is biased, and that's actually a good thing. Uh, you do have particles uh, generated from this. Most of them are small, but with general advancement and moving the burr back and allowing blood flow, of course, um, you know uh, that that you know unless you're uh, really in a massively calcified lesion, that has not been much of a problem with good technique. Now, in terms of data, I'm not going to dwell on too much of it. There isn't a lot of contemporary data in the DES era. One of it was uh, uh, the Rotaxis, which was an, a small study using uh, the taxis stent, of course, which was, we won't comment on that, versus sort of a PTCA strategy and looking at outcomes. Late loss was the primary, um, was actually the the primary endpoint, but the key finding here is what's practical in terms of the, uh, uh, in, in terms of the utility of it. And what they saw, if you did, did an upfront rotablator uh, in these complex lesions, you had much less, you had very little crossover. If you went with a balloon, you had a 12% crossover and a two and a half percent stent loss. Okay, thus showing a difference in the strategy success. Now. Ulti you know, uh, ultimately in the maze rate, there was no difference in an underpowered study, but here what you saw, and this was a observations that it was seen over many years, the rotoblader actually enhanced late loss 
with these taxes uh, stents, which were not you know, great stents to begin with. But importantly, an insight here is when you looked at those who crossed over, predominantly, if you had severe calcium as opposed to moderate, you had a one in three uh, crossover rate. So that's, you know, that indicates that when you see severe calcium, upfront rotablator is, uh, uh, or atherectomy is indicated. A more recent study, which I will, was prepare cal, which is sort of a modification of that, um, of that design, of course, with contemporary DES and also modified balloons like scoring and cutting balloons in the arm versus atherectomy up front. And again, they found the 16% crossover, very reminiscent of, of the, uh, uh, obviously of Rotaxis and the contemporary. But the difference here is you didn't lose anything by applying it. Your late loss was the same with contemporary stenting. Again, clinical outcomes at nine months were indistinguishable, but your procedures went much more smooth, smoothly. And this is actually data from Antonio's lab, really in, in a real world indicating that that when you do a planned rotablator versus a crossover, you ended up with fewer balloons, uh, quicker procedures, less fluoro time, and of course, less contrast, reinforcing that concept. Now, the other uh, device uh, is the orbital atherectomy. This may not be playing, as I apologize, this isn't the computer I was gonna use, but as you can see, this is, a, 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 this is uh, mounted in the middle shaft of the, uh, of the device and it rotates circumferentially uh, in, into it. The key here is you have a nose cone, which spins and gets into, sorry, and gets into the lesion, again, with orthogonal displacement of, of, of friction. A key point here is you wanna always keep this the opaque part of the wire at least five millimeters ahead of the, uh, of, uh, the tip. Uh, the idea here is this, it orbits, it's a rotational atherectomy, so it sands allegedly, you know, the whole circumference of the vessel. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. And, uh, and also there's what they call calcium modification, which, you know, to me, it's just the physical aspect of this, you know, uh, cutting and banging on the wall that creates dissections, which as Antonio taught us many years ago, that's really what our objective is in these calcified lesions is to create a, uh, a dissection. Um, this device, again, it, it looks actually very similar to the Rota, uh, the Rota Pro now because the Rota Pro actually emulated this. Uh, all, uh, this is an electric motor though, uh, all on the handle with a very small uh, console. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and it also has a sort of what they call a glide assist, which is a Dynaglide feature, which allows it on low low uh, on very low um, RPMs to go through the uh, go through around tortuous bends, more facility. It also generates particles that might be a little smaller than rotablator, but I don't think that's key. Uh, there's uh, recent changes in, the in this, which I won't go into too much detail, but the point is there have been enhancements in this in terms of the, uh, in terms of the speed of the uh, device and also the ability to prime this along with the uh, glide assist. Uh, let's see if this will play, which it's not. I'm sorry about that. But a key thought, a point about this device is the force generated is proportional to the square, all right, of the velocity. So if you go from 80 to a, a 120, you really have uh, over twice the force and, but as you get into a larger radius, okay, the force diminishes. So when you get into larger vessels, areas that you don't really wanna cut, you're really not doing much. And this is the key aspect to the technique here. If you say, look at the one centimeter uh, per second at 80K, this is uh, the number of passes. This is the effective uh, lumen that you get. But if you do that same at 80K, going at one millimeters per second, with multiple passes, you can see on a time basis and um, with going slowly, you see you get much more efficacy. And if you go up to high speed, you can actually create a, a lumen with multiple passes that are really the equivalent of a 175 burr. And I think that's sort of a, really an advantage to this uh, that you don't really have to switch burrs. And if your practice is to upsize routinely 
there is certainly an advantage to this. Another aspect of this device, and they've sort of leapfrogged Boston in this, even though Boston made some attempts, they have improved the wire a bit. They've made it a bit more flexible, but importantly, they had this night and all tip. And frankly, this wire does handle, it's, uh, does handle very well and actually we use it very frequently for primary wiring because you know the tip is very robust and it, because it is thicker than a rotoblader wire it actually is more uh, it is more uh, responsive and another aspect of this which works for and against this is the guide wire bias aspect as I emphasized before with the rotoblader you actually create you know you groove into a device so here you're biased on the outer curvature but the emphasis here with orbital is that, of course, it, it goes on both sides of the vessel here. But remember, if you have extreme wire bias and tortuosity, whoops, sorry about that. If you keep in mind, this rotation could actually wobble and go further into the wall with extreme wire bias than this, which is why I would emphasize that in extreme curves, you really want to avoid using orbital atherectomy because this, which works for its advantage in straighter anatomy or slight curvature, in extreme curvature and extreme wire bias can be uh, can certainly be uh, potentially problematic. In the data, the, this was approved. I won't dwell on it too much. It was it was really just a registry because there was no predicate device in terms of uh, approval for calcium. It was over 400 patients with multiple year follow up here. It was the sort of the usual demographic uh, with this is this is not core lab, by the way. They say it was about an, you know, an 85% percent stenosis, which on core lab, you know, was virtually impossible. Uh, but you know, it's visual. And the uh, and it was about 18 millimeters long, with uh, most of this being angiographically heavy calcium, even though Ivis calcium was a qualifier. Uh, the in-hospital mace was uh, driven mainly by this, you know, FDA mandated CKMB, but all the other uh, outcomes were certainly were more than acceptable in a calcified population. And uh, as you can see, the MACE rate increment was typical of this type of calcified vessel population with uh, mainly out of hospital uh, events uh, because of their intrinsic uh, extensive disease. A key point here though, was that, um, dissections and perforations were low <clears throat> and the slow flow was low. The, the advantage of this device over rotoblade, of course, is you're never really occlusive and that you maintain flow throughout the, uh, um, about the procedure. These are just the, uh, the, uh, the mace rates over the course of three years with very low target lesion uh, failure. So, <clears throat> so the indications of, of, are for lesions uh, less than 25 millimeters, and I would not use it in vessels less than 2.5 millimeters. Small vessels are good. Um, just to compare the two, unfortunately, again, this is a, imagine this is an LAD. You can see it here. This is the LAD. And what you can see here, here's an OCT before, and here's your rotoblader. And as you can see, there's the wire bias. And you can see from here to here, you see you've cut into the calcium and thinned it out and on this side as well, because here the bias is over here at, uh, at seven and eight o'clock. And here it is again, cutting more uh, laterally. Here it's not cutting here, because here you're in, you know, you're in a soft plaque here and you're not cutting very, not much at all. But the key here is to emphasize the, the grooving and what I see, the little bit of the snowman and the thinning that allows the balloon to leverage and crack it. And of course, um, but after, Here's pros roto, and here, of course, here's after stenting, which is the you know excellent stent expansion, and of course, single or multiple fractures are commonly seen behind the stent after the stent uh, deployment. You may see the fractures beforehand as well. With orbital atherectomy, what you see is a little different. I mean, in this a very similar lesion, uh, what you're going to see here is there is in the larger vessel, as you can see, it did shave down here, unlike rotoblation. But again, in the lesion, it looks very similar. In the tight areas, you do just groove into where the wire biases. It does not really go in this wide circumference, but it looks a lot like rotoblation. But in the outflows, uh, you see there is a difference. And But again, when you get to the end of the procedure, you see the calcium fractures and the stent expansion 
So really at the end of the procedure, if you do both techniques correctly, you end up uh, in the same uh, place. Now, um, I won't go into this. I think importantly here, and this is a, one of these really meticulous observations that was done by, uh, uh, by uh, Kiko and her fellows, is the important thing, and to emphasize what I showed you on, the, on, the, uh, on those uh, uh, slices of, of the uh, OCTs, is that if you look at, um, you know, if you look at uh, calcium modification and you look at the lumens, in the larger lumens, the rotoblader has less calcium modification than the orbital. They, but when you get to the smaller lumens, it's actually very, uh, it's uh, very, sim uh, very similar. And again, it's true in the calcium angle. When the calcium angle is, um, is less, you get more modification with the orbit than you do with rot rot ablation. So when it, but in terms of in the smaller lesions, as you can see here, when the lesions are small, the calcium modification is similar. You just see a trend towards less in the larger lumens. And so it's sort of the inflow and the outflow will be more impacted with that translates into. Um, we did have some early retrospective data in terms of the microcirculation, look at IMR, which showed a, a, a little better with, uh, with, with uh, orbital than uh, rotational atherectomy, looking at intracoronary uh, resistances. But we do have some randomized data, which uh, have just been analyzed, which will give us a more objective uh, um, understanding of that. In terms of comparison, just briefly, I just referred to just, just a recent meta-analysis of all trials, you know, showing maybe a little less fluoroscopy time with orbital, uh, but um, in terms of interprocedural and paraprocedural complications, very similar. And again, when you look at uh, clinical outcomes in long term, they're, uh, they're virtually uh, uh, identical. So I think to me, the advantages of the each, each uh, system has an advantage. Uh, for the orbital, it's a very quick setup. You don't need a pacemaker. We looked at this in the right coronaries. You need a pacemaker or bradycardia, really a significant less than 2% of the time. I think you do get less slow flow. And you, again, you have the advantage of being able to quote upsize by using a fast speeds, which a lot of it's fallen out of favor. But frankly, for me, for large vessels in straight segments, I really use it because uh, I think it's an advantage for RA. It's front cutting for severe stenosis, though it's really been quite a while that we haven't been able to get an orbit into a tight lesion, as I said, because of the frictional displacement of the tip, because of the rotations. I still favor this for aortal osteo lesions. And again, as I emphasize, it's severe angulation with more wire bias, and I think it's less uh, risk of uh, perforation. What do I do? I frankly, I do default to orbital just because it's quicker, and as you can see, the outcomes overall clinically are, are, are very similar. And again, I'll emphasize, I choose rotational atherectomy for angulation and orbit. Uh, and that, again, I've discussed this already, why I, uh, I'm concerned, oh, this one plays. Uh, you can imagine this wobbling around in a, when you're caught in one tight area with extreme wire bias in a, in a, in a curve that you've uh, straightened out. Um, now we do, does now in terms of the overall field, I think we're waiting for the Eclipse trial, which is uh, slogging along but making progress, which compares in calcified lesions and orbital strategy from conventional angioplasty strategy. I'm going to sample size this size. We'll get some insight overall, whether overall MACE rate at one year, target vessel failure, is different between the two strategies. And also, um, of course, we're going to get enormous insights with, with a lot of the uh, imaging studies into where the utility of this device is best. So I think what I'll say in summary is atherectomy is certainly an essential part of the armamentarium and every operator has to master it and be comfortable with at least one of these techniques. <laughs> I generally reserve it for heavy calcium. As you see, we have our algorithmic approach now. There's no guesswork. It's not shrugging your shoulders. Uh, I, you know, one, if you try to get away with it, you know, as we saw in, in, the, in the two smaller studies, <clears throat> especially in severe calcium, that's when you get into trouble with dissections on dilatable lesions. And if you think you'll be using it, it's like tracheostomy should probably do it. And I think there is a growing evidence base. And I think with Eclipse, we'll have a much stronger rationale uh, of, and, and, and focus on where to use it in the next few years. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Jeff. That was really superb. Um, and I really enjoyed the whole explanation of how um, mechanistically the two differ um, and which lesions you prefer or which type of vessels you prefer, one versus the other. Um, I thought it was really important for our colleagues to hear. But I also think, you know, I wanted Antonio to comment about this, um, that I still hear people using the word debulking when it comes to calcium, calcified lesions, right? Um, and I think both of you did, you know, a lot of work uh, years ago already showing that the whole concept of debulking actually is is not valid. Um, that, and I think, you know, part of why we go with smaller burrs and we've changed our approach to atherectomy. Uh, Antonio, maybe you want to have a, you, you want to make a quick comment or question to uh, No, I uh, thank you very much and congratulations, Jeff, very clear talk. Uh, a lot of important data. I think uh, plaque modification is, uh, is key. If we want to make progress, uh, we need uh, to improve uh, stent expansion, to make stents more symmetric, more round. And we have to give credit to bioresorbable scaffolds that uh, regained our mindset into lesion preparation. I have a, I have a question for Jeff. Uh, when you do orbital atherectomy, how frequently do you, do you take advantage from ablation on the way back instead of ablation on the way in? Oh, that, yeah, I probably should emphasize. No, I, you're, the slow movement is both forward and back. And I think because as you saw in those, uh, on those slides, the more passes you make, Obviously you wanna go slowly, but as with each incremental pass, you actually get a larger lumen, at least in these, in these models. So I really uh, do it very slowly in both directions. I don't see, I don't treat it any differently going forward or backwards. So my next question is, what do you think about making the rotablator burr with diamond on each side? So you can rotablate effectively, not only on the way in, but uh, taking advantage of the reverse wire bias, rotor blade when you pull, pull back. Yeah, my understanding is that's actually under development. It's under development. Yeah, yeah. You know, there is a whole other, there's the Tesla, they're calling it. You know, I'm sure you've seen that, right? Well, we, we said they're, 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 you know, they'll have an electric motor and they, I think there'll be, it'll be a whole, you know, much more modified platform going forward. I don't know what the timing of it is now, what the investment will be in it. But I mean, I have seen, you know, prototypes along those lines. So, yeah. There's also Antonio, you know, there's the Cyclone project from Medtronic, uh, which is also rotational atherectomy uh, that goes over 014 wire, over any 014 wire. So once you've crossed with whatever wire you have, you don't have to change. Uh, you can use the same wire to do your atherectomy on. And the diamond extends further back so that you're able to, you know, burr essentially moving forward and backwards. It's also not gas operated, it's electric. So similar to what orbital is. So I think there's going to be a couple of other options in the near future. And uh, another question. When you have a nodular calcium, nodular calcium is, uh, is not easy uh, to handle. Uh, what are your device of choice? Uh, well, as a rule, we'll go with orbit. With orbit. Um, and if, yeah, you don't have been... orbit, if you don't have orbit, in Europe, we don't have orbit. What would you suggest? Well, then I, uh, frankly, I, then I use, I use a scoring balloon. And, uh, you know, and, but also I'm a little careful on the sizing because, you know, if you, I think of it sort of like Taver, I don't want to take a calcific nodule and extrude it through the wall, you know, similar to the way you'll be a little more conservative on your sizing with your valve when you see that big, you know, hunk of calcium, at, you know, at the base. Um, so, uh, so I would go with that. And, you know, and it's interesting because we just did a little survey of this with calcific nodules with a case report, but you know, these nodules really can lead to a restenosis, as you know, as they can, I think they help create stent fractures and they can extrude actually through it. So there's no really good solution for it, but I, do, I don't think rotablator, unless you can see 
tremendous bias. But when you think about the mechanism, Antonio, and you're in a big nodule, making a tiny little groove in it is not going to thin it out enough to fracture it. And it's hard to get the leverage when you have, say, 200 degrees of normal vessel that's going to expand anyway, and you're not going to be able to get the leverage to crack that nodule. And, uh, you know, I may add that, that the lithotripsy is very little effectiveness. Yeah. In very little. Some people say it's effective, but it's just a piece of luck. Yeah. Most of the time it's not effective. Yeah, I think lithotripsy actually, the more concentric the calcification is, the better it is for lithotripsy. Yeah. I think yeah. once you have you know, very focal calcification that's very eccentric on nodules. It doesn't seem, uh, in our experience, to work as well. Yeah. Dimitri? Jeff, another great talk again, of course, uh, from you about uh, uh, calcium and uh, the various uh, atherectomy techniques. Uh, let me ask you about uh, neocalcification instant. Uh, as we see uh, older DES come uh, to restenose uh, years later, we're finding more and more neocalcification instant. And mm -hmm. in this situation, what is your go-to uh, device for that? Yeah, well, you know, I'll be honest. I mean, we see a lot of it. Obviously, I do a lot of instant restenosis because of our, you know, you know, because of our brachytherapy practice. And it's very, uh, very common. In the very older stents, you know, and I'm, here I'm even talking about BMS. Um, you know, we have had to resort to atherectomy, and I think orbital makes orbital sort of makes a little more sense here um, because you know you're not you can't really you're not just trying to uh, leverage it to crack it because you can't really expand the vessel very much because of this you know the, the encapsulation by uh, the stent. But as a rule, thus far, I found that you know high pressure balloons and specialty balloons uh, have uh, been adequate. And you know, in the more common two-year-out, you know, neoatherosclerotic uh, vessels, but the very old one, yeah, they can behave, as far as I'm concerned, like any any calc severely calcified vessel, but with the limitation that you can't leverage the, the fracture of it into you know vessel expansion, you know, and and really cracking it because of expanding it maximally because of the ability to expand the entire vessel. I have a couple of questions, both for you, Antonio and Jeff, um, which I'm going to call the section fact or fallacy. Okay. Um, because I get, I hear a lot of comments and, and these things said on a, on a common basis, and I'm not sure how much is fact or fallacy. Uh, so number one, never use a cutting balloon after atherectomy because you increase the risk of perforation. Fact or fallacy? Well, if anything, the data are the opposite. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm, I can't say I'm the biggest fan of it, but there is enough data and we've looked at it as well. And, um, and there is supposedly a trial that was supposed to go on with, with, um, with Boston, uh, really comparing a, a follow-up cutting balloon that lead, allows you to get many more fractures when you uh, expand your stent. Uh, so it is not per se hazardous if you obviously if you size it adequately and if anything it I don't know about the clinical utility but certainly on imaging you do get more fractures but uh, I I think you have to be a little bit more careful about sizing and inflation pressure of the cutting balloon but I would not say that is contraindicated I think you have to be more careful because you are applying two ablative, te ablative two plaque modification techniques, uh, but uh, I would not say that is uh, contraindicated. But I, I would emphasize image guidance. Uh, yeah, to, absolutely. In mandatory. Image guide, and every time uh, you are modifying uh, in a, in a proper way a lesion, you always have to have in your pocket a dry a cover stent. Eh? So, <laughs> While we're on that, um, just before we carry on the fact of fallacy, someone asked, cutting balloon versus angio scalp, if you're going to use it after atherectomy, any difference for either of you? Or it doesn't matter? I personally like more the cutting. It's a little bit more aggressive, uh, but more effective. Maybe in angulated segments, 
uh, scoring balloon is better and maybe safer. So uh, I'll confess, I mean, I lean more towards the angioscope. Though I, I, the current, you know, the Wolverine now has actually uh, impressed me in terms of its deliverability, but I still feel a little safer, maybe because of personal experience with the angioscope. But that's purely personal experience. I totally agree with Jeff. Angioscope is much safer than uh, the, the cutting balloon. If, if I use a cutting balloon, I almost always use imaging because I don't want to oversize the balloon. Okay, great. Here's another one. Um, atherectomy is contraindicated in the presence of dissection. Uh, that's a no, no, absolutely no. Uh, as a matter of fact, I read extensively about this because I did expert witness in a couple of legal cases and is not contraindicated. You have to keep in mind that you know this this uh, you know this balloon escalation strategy. I mean, if I, we could have many case examples where you frequently end up with dissections and an undilated lesion. And uh, with careful application, um, yeah, you still have to modify the plaque and expand your stent. Otherwise, you know, what are you going to do? Let it close or send it to surgery? But you know, it's judicious, but absolutely not a contraindication. So, yeah, very, but I wouldn't use orbital. Let's put it that way. I would not use orbital in that circumstance. There are very few procedures that are contraindicated in a dissection. No, contrast injection can make an occlusive dissection an open dissection. <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> Just put a drain in here, fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Actually, Jeff answered the question already. I was going to ask, you know, in that setting, which of those, which yeah. of the two uh, devices would you go, would you reach for? And um, uh, I would say RA would be the choice there. Yeah, I always wor worry about orbital sort of unraveling the toilet paper. And there have been some case examples of that. Right. Wow. So I have a, I have two other, a couple of others here again. Um, flushing in between uh, your passage of birds decreases uh, no reflow. Uh, you mean my idea of flushing is you know blood flow, the heart, the heart. <laughs> The flushing with normal saline. Letting it breathe in between every. I mean, in the old days there was the saying that if you flushed after you did. So you do a run with rotor, yeah. you stop and you flush with saline, maybe this is going to decrease I mean, no reflow. And Tony, remember, that was the technique I think Murray's book binder like for no flow with a lot of flushing. But, you know, I had a pediatric professor who used to say when, when a woman when a woman calls me, their kid has a has a seizure. And I tell them to put him in the bathroom and turn on the steam and this and that. It doesn't do anything. It gives her something to do till I come. So the point is, I think the flushing gives you time, something to do until, until it resolves. Obviously, you want to use your vasodilators and the like, but I don't, I don't put much stock in it. I'm not sure that flushing helps, but uh, I think you are, the only thing that you should not do when you have no flow is to keep rotablating. You have yeah. to correct the slow flow before doing to the next pass. Yeah, don't right. do multiple passes unless you correct the no reflow, the slow flow. Mm -hmm. um, then there was also, um, because I said this is the difference between the US and Europe, um, rotated live is important for, for performing or atherectomy. I, you know, I, I'm skeptical. We use it, but I think you can do fine without it. <laughs> Antonio, I haven't seen you use rotary glide in about 15 years. Yeah. But I don't use it because I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's your, there's your case, <laughs> right? Okay, so you would use it if you had it. Yeah. If I have it, uh, maybe I would try. Why not? Yeah. Okay. And, and then you can use it on your salad also. <laughs> <laughs> it does look like a salad dressing. Well, it has a lot of those components. <laughs> you can do rotational atherectomy without it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then um, one for each of you, just really on technique. 
so the first one for Jeff. Jeff, aorta osteolesions. Yeah. Tight aorta osteolesions. What's the technique for doing atherectomy safely? I'm going to assume from your talk, you're going to do rotor, but maybe just, you know, if you can comment for the fellows, what's the best technique? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, guide alignment is key. And I think you have to do look in multiple views, Espe you know, especially in the right coronary, because, um, you know, you can be deceived. And you're, you know, let's say your guide is not coaxial with it. You want to make sure it's coaxial, especially in the RAO, which you'll lose it, because otherwise you have an excellent chance of, you know, cutting directly into the aortic wall. Uh, it's true in the left, though. Frankly, you know, you know, an EBU guide or the like will, uh, or an L4 will align a little better. But again, multiple views and make sure you're coaxial aligned and work on that if you have to. Initially, you know, get you know, get a strong guide wire and get it aligned, and then take your microcatheter, and then you know, and then swap out for the uh, for the for the uh, atherectomy wire. Great, um, Antonio. Calcified bifurcations with one 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 uh, stenosis, where both an important main branch and important side branch have a very tight calcific stenosis. Um, what do you, I mean, well, how do you tackle those? What do you rotor first? Do you risk losing the branch? Um, I've seen now, you know, some people are proposing, for example, for left main, you know, very aggressive techniques where they put in eight French guides with a guide liner uh, so you can protect the wire to the side branch. I mean, do we need to do that or do you have a, do you have a more simplified approach? I... If you can, if the side branch is large enough, I would rotate rota blade on both. In uh, my career, I never lost a side branch because I did rotational laterectomy on the main branch. So I don't think you need to protect the side branch, but uh, I think sooner or later you will lose the side branch because everything will happen. Eh? But don't believe that this is a, a so frequent phenomena that you have to go and find a way to protect side branches while you do rotational laterectomy on the main branch. Yeah, I think it's making a mountain out of a molehill. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. combine how many years, would we have 50 years of rotoblader experience at least between us? And uh, that, that we do not, you don't lose brain. Actually, prepare calc. Actually, the data showed side branch loss was much different, Absolutely. even that's all. Absolutely. It's more, it's more likely that you get a car accident going back home. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask though, in that setting, do you reach for RA exclusively or would you, is there a role for orbital in that, in that 111 uh, scenario? Do you, do you, would you use one over the other? For me, it would depend on the angulation of the bifurcation, strictly. Ty very, you know, 90 degree angle, I'd go, you know, yeah. I'll go with rotation. Antonio, there's, there's a question from one of the colleagues, maybe for both of you, but maybe Antonio will have more experience on this whole sort of rotor shock um, approach of doing shock wave, or, you know, a rotor followed by shock wave in in lesions that have both superficial and deep calcium. Uh, any thoughts? So if, uh, if you have a tight, uh, a tight lesion in a 3.5 vessel, uh, you do rotablation because the shockwave balloon doesn't pass, uh, or not even uh, in any balloon passes. Uh, but then you know if you do 1.5 burr in a 3.5 vessel, uh, then you do IBUS, and if you still see a lot of calcium, especially circumferential, I would not take a two over, even if I have a bigger guiding catheter, I would use lithotripsy because it's a safer, more gentle, and maybe even more effective. So I think multiple uh, uh, techniques can be combined together. That's the reason why I'm always skeptical to go to do one against the other randomized study, because in some lesions, you need multiple techniques. But you're talking about car accidents. In the US, that's a good down payment on a car, by the way, those two devices together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty expensive here at times. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> Jeff, you showed earlier in your talk a, a, a pie graph of, uh, you know, 90% of uh, uh, operators not using any type of atherectomy or cutting balloon. Um, do you think that's a, um, is there a misconception that, the, that it's not a safe technique? Is it just the unwillingness of uh, operators to tackle uh, difficult lesions. What do you think is the issue there, and how do we change that as a as a uh, as a field? Yeah. Well, I think I mean these are remember Adapt DES was done a while ago. More Nira Bear has actually looked at the trends in atherectomy over the last few years, and since the introduction of orbital atherectomy, it, you know atherectomy has gone up, and I think it's both rotoblader and you know and orbital because I think having a new entry into the field. Obviously, heightened awareness. I think we look, look look at how much data we're producing on this, and we have a huge randomized trial. And I think you know, but I think you know, lithotripsy will also you know because of simplification it will uh, make things easier. And frankly, I think the orbital is a simpler technique and easier to learn. And I you know, so I think for novices and low low volume operators, I think it's a, that's I think that's one of the ways to do it. But the key is for people to understand the outcomes differences with it. And I think if Eclipse is positive or we get some very important subsets out of it, if we don't get a positive trial, I think that evidence base will also propel guidelines and move the field forward. Jeff, um, there's another question from, um, from one of our participants. Um, and it's something I've actually seen, I never faced that often in Milano, but I'm facing it more and more often here in the Bronx, uh, is the fact of, you know, patients coming in with ACS or thrombotic like lesions, but also very calcified lesions yeah. at the same time. Thoughts on atherectomy in, in those kind of lesions when you have thrombus as well, and, you know, it's a calcified lesion with ACS, any experience or any advice? Uh, my feeling is you got to do what you got to do. I mean, you want to differentiate it. And obviously, the w one key pitfall, though, and I have a, a good case example, I show one of IJ's cases, where you're sure it's calcium. <laughs> wow. And of course, it's thrombus and vice, vice versa. So again, I hate to be, you know, one note, one note person here, but I think imaging is key. But you know, you, there's no real alternative if you have extensive calcification. And I think a lot of the data were derived before we had effective antiplatelet therapy. Mm -hmm. So I think with our, you know, remember this was, these people were running in on aspirin alone. Think about the, a lot of the data accumulation back then. So I think with, you know, good antiplatelet coverage and intravenous, you know, whether Kangalore or the like, I would, by the way, I would not, do not like 2B3As here, just for the record. Mm -hmm. uh, out there, but I'm thinking about, but I think you, I think you can, uh, I, I, I don't think we've seen much problem with that. We, and now you know, you, see, you do a lot of it now with ACS because remember so many of the elderly ACSs are calcified nodules. And I think it used to be 2%. I think it's a much higher percentage now. So I have a question for Jeff. When you are rotablating or atherectomizing long segments in length, do you believe that uh, giving Candrelor may help? Uh, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> For me, it would be a belief, like, you know, you believe in God. You know, I mean, it's like, it would be an article of faith because I have no, I mean, you know, if you look at the data, I'm sure Greg could give you a whole talk or Philippe about, inter, you know, inter, intracoronary thrombus and the like. And I'm sure angiographically, they did see benefits from using Cangrelor, but I'm not sure how much it translated into except, you know, some, you know, some uh, procedural quote MIs. And the like. Have you ever used it? Did you use no, it? No, I haven't. Not in that circumstance per se, no. I'm telling you, uh, let me ask you, I mean, you guys have had shockwave in Europe now for uh, close to five years, I think. Um, you know, we're hoping to get it approved here in the U.S. within the next couple of months. And there's a lot of discussion about what impact shockwave is going to have, right? Will it replace atherectomy in, some, in many cases? Or will it allow operators who are a little bit um, concerned about doing atherectomy, don't have the experience with atherectomy, to get better outcomes in calcified lesions and implant less expanded stents? There's a lot of sort of this discussion going on. 
I mean, what has your thoughts been so far since? I mean, how has it changed your practice? But my thought is that it's not going to replace anything. It's not going to replace rot ablation. It's not going to replace cutting. But uh, if used appropriately, should make the final result better. And uh, that's it. Uh, uh, because uh, rot ablator is, uh, uh, cannot be substituted by lithotripsy. Jeff, any difference? Well, when I think of the complexion of the lesions that I use atherectomy on, I mean, unless they make some major enhancements of this balloon, which I think is, you know, difficult given the hardware in there, I, you know, I think it's the, a large, the vast majority of cases that I use atherectomy on, you're not going to be able to pass uh, lithotripsy as the initial balloon. And once you've invested in the atherectomy catheter, my belief is, the va again, the overwhelming majority of the time you can expand the balloon. What I might do with the with the strip chipsy is not, you know, go up to 20 or 30 atmospheres. Remember, we don't have OPNs here, um, but then maybe reach for the uh, atherectomy, uh, the, or, the uh, lithotripsy earlier. But one thing I'll say, and I'll ask you guys, that, you know, lithotripsy lithot gives you about, what, 60 atmospheres, right? The OPN yeah. goes, what, the 40 or 50 atmospheres. So, oh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it may create more of a dissection, but that may be another alternative that comes along the line, though. I, it's been years since I've spoken to them, and I haven't seen them really, uh, really moving into the U.S. No. I mean, Antonio, are you still using a lot of OPNs? No, not a lot. Not a lot. I'm, uh, I'm not enthusiastic about using OPN, uh, despite the fact that I think it's an important device. But uh, I don't use a lot. I think it's uh, you have to be careful because uh, uh, you know if you use it a lot, uh, it's uh, safe because uh, every time you do you do something a lot, you have less complication because you use less than uh, when it's needed. But if you really use it when it's very needed, you have to be careful. Have you had experiences, perforations and the like? Is that your main experience? Or dissections? No, but, uh, believe it or not, uh, we, never, we never had uh, a rupture with the uh, vessel rupture with the OPN. Oh, okay. We had a vessel rupture with the <laughs> compliant balloon, but not with OPN. So maybe but last question. Um... When we use OPN, we always, always do IBUS before. Yeah. No question. Last question. Um, no one's mentioned laser in, uh, yeah. in the last hour. Um, other than in underexpanded stents, I mean, what do you guys see the role for lasers in calcified lesions? Uh, well, uh, desperation when you can't get a rotor wire across. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, hopefully, this, you know, the shock bubble will go, you know, go ahead because the laser will usually not cross those lesions and the like. But I think in the stents, I mean, I will, you know, I would, at this juncture, I go with a, a peripheral lithotripsy these days before I go with laser. And, and I look, I'll give credit, I brought laser to the U.S. based on an experience of Antonio's. Right? <laughs> and the index case was an osteal vein graft. Remember Antonio? Yes, yes. Remember this? I may remember some of these things better than you do, <laughs> because you do so many of these type of things. But there was an osteal vein that wouldn't yield, and he used laser with contrast to, to have the osteal vein open. And that's and I took that home to the U.S. What do you think about laser in thrombotic lesions? <laughs> that's where we came in. That's the '90s. <laughs> we actually tried a mini trial. And we had enough perforations that we stopped. I actually was PI of that. So that's my experience. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there are any, if there are no, any final comments. Um, no? If not, uh, really, thank you both. Thank you, Jeff, for a great talk. And Dimitri, Antonio, for an excellent discussion. This is a great way to start 2021 with uh, all of you. Well, thanks for putting it together. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye now. Hey, that's a good start.